You know, in the area of human achievement, the superb accomplishments of violinists have perhaps, uh, how should I say this, have perhaps captured the attention of many, many thousands of people. And, uh, you know, when you think of violinists, and I'm not a musician by any, by any means, and, and I don't know a whole lot about all this stuff there, but I do know this, that when you hear good music, you know good music, amen? And uh, there are violinists that perhaps by name who just have captured the attention and perhaps the affection of people. There are violinists that certainly we could probably name off the top tip of our tongue, especially those of you who are musicians that kind of stand out of you. I think of uh, Itzhak Perlman and people like that. I mean, there are names like that. But there's one violinist who stands perhaps head and shoulders above the be- of all of them, who some believe could be among the best of the best, and his name is Fritz Kreisler, a German and Jewish, uh, if you would, violinist. And some things that you will find written about him are this. They say things like, well, he was born in Vienna in 1875, and, they say, and one writer said this, Fritz Kreisler was a violinist like no other. Another writer said this, there's no mistaking the sound of Fritz Kreisler. He was the ultimate golden age violinist, one whose personality, distinctive tone, and expressive, seductive way with vibrato, uh, portamento, and rhythm are instantly recognizable, yet always rooted in empathy with the genuine spirit of the music. And that's a mouthful there, but basically saying that when you, when you listen to the words of a violinist like Fritz Kreis, who just captures your attention there. During his time, there's no question, Fritz Kreisler was considered matchless, unequaled, and unparalleled. You might say that there was none like him during his time. Now, our focus tonight is not about violinists. Our focus tonight is about God. Amen? And I, and I think it's good to say this evening that there's none like unto the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah, writing here in chapter 10, is just saying, thus saith the Lord. And uh, when we read through Jeremiah, you have to kind of read through Jeremiah through one complete reading to, to appreciate this. But we find, as he's, he's delivering these these very strong and sometimes very harsh messages against the people of Judah and Jerusalem for uh, their sins, that every now and then that Jeremiah would kind of park on the side and he would just say some things about God. And you read about this, like I'm thinking about Jeremiah 32 for right now. And, and, and he was, you, you read these things, you have to think, Jeremiah was such in awe of who God is. And I think we have to remind ourselves we read through Jeremiah more than just being a book that gives, uh, that speaks about prophecy and the judgment of God and the coming of the Babylonian nation, Jeremiah does great justice in helping us understand how much he was in awe of the greatness and the matchlessness, the unequaledness, the unparalleledness of the, the, the just the superbness of who God is, his greatness and his sovereignty. And he does that there. And he says here, there is none like unto God. There's no comparison to who God is. He was saying God is matchless. God is unparalleled. God is so great. There's no one nothing, no one there that's even close to God. Now, there are three things I want you to see about our past of Scripture tonight. Very, three very simple thoughts I want to give you tonight. Number one, write this down. Number one, I want you to see the inferior. I want you to see the inferior. As he gets into talking about there's none like unto God, he begins by speaking about that which is inferior. He speaks about that which is inferior to the glory of God. Now, there's two things we see about that which is inferior. First of all, as we go back a couple of verses, he, he speaks about the inferior of personal glory, the inferior of personal glory. Because, you know, the, the people had gotten to the place, the people, the Jews had gotten to where they were very comfortable. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the Word of God. If you got to stand up toe-to-toe with the Jew, you could not out-discuss with the Jew or out-debate a Jew about everything they knew theologically about God. But the Jews had gone to the place that he describes, as we saw in our previous time we were here, in Jeremiah 9, verses 20 through 24, they fi- found themselves in three categories of people. They found themselves being described as wise men, rich men, and mighty men. And he's defining here the fact that they, they, these people had gone to the place where they were glorifying themselves personally personal, personally. And so Jeremiah has to write this to, to tell them or refute the fact of the inferior of personal glory. Now, personal glory simply said is I'm, is glorying in myself. It's glorying in my accomplishments. It's glorying in terms of my knowledge. It's glorying in terms of my might, my accumulations, my accomplishments. It's when we are self-dependent, self-reliant, and self-focused. We're always trying to figure out our way and doing things, and we don't really need God. It's just we do things. We don't need to pray about things, 
because we, need, we just have it all figured out. And we come to this place where we think other people are inferior to us and other things are inferior to us because we, we think we're great. We're kind of like the Muhammad Ali statement. I'm great. I'm the greatest. Nobody compares to me. And that's kind of where the thought was where they were that. Uh, with these Jews, God was there, but God was not important. God was there, but they said, I can take care of myself. I'll, I'll solve my own problem. They got to the place where the financial plan was superseded the Father's plan. They got to the place where their strategic planning superseded the sovereign plan of God for the life. And so personal glory is when we glory in ourselves and we don't give God the glory. Go back to chapter 9 again and notice in verses 20 through 24 what he says. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. He's identifying three categories of thought process. The strong, the, the wise, or the smart, or, and those who are very wealthy. He says, don't glory in what your wisdom. Don't glory in your might. Don't glory in, 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 in your riches. He said, all that's going to fade away. He said, all that is, that, is, that is inferior to the things of God. But he says, if we're going to glory, he said in verse 24, let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. The greatest quest in life, as we said last time, the greatest ambition we should have is to understand and know God, to grow in our knowledge of God, to grow in our spiritual growth. Now listen, we, we need to take a stop every now and then to just assess in ourselves how are we growing and where are we going. It's one thing to grow intellectually. It's another thing to be growing spiritually. Do you find yourself that you're growing in a spirit of meekness? The Bible says that the hidden man of the heart is a spirit of meekness and, and in that that is of great price to God. Are we growing in the spirit of meekness? Do we find ourselves growing in grace? Are we finding ourselves that we're becoming weaker, that we're becoming stronger in the grace of God? Are we finding God's grace working in our life, that we're able to just, you know, just bear with that trial and we have that spirit of endurance? Do we find ourselves growing in holy boldness and trying to help other people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior? We need to be careful that our benchmark is not a physical benchmark, but a spiritual benchmark by which we assess where we're going in our lives here. And he says, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Notice that I am the Lord, that God is God. It doesn't matter who's present. I mean, we're going to be focused on midterm elections in a few days and kind of the buzz everyone's going to talk about. Who are you going to vote for? And what about this guy? And what about that guy? Well, that's important for us, but we must stop for every now and then and remind ourselves, God is the Lord, amen, that I am the Lord. And he says, I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. And there's so much we could say about those three attributes of his holiness, his loving kindness, his judgment, and his righteousness. He says, in the earth, for he says, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So there's the inferior personal glory. If we really give ourselves to knowing God and to knowing like we should, we will be like Jeremiah. We will be in continuous awe of God. We will worship the Lord as he should be worshiped. We'll be like that leper we studied about this morning, that he didn't take a course on theology. He didn't take a course on how to worship God or worship 101. He didn't read somebody's theological book about what worship's all about. By the way, you don't need to buy a book about worship. Just read your Bible and you'll worship God. Amen. You don't need to learn it from somebody else has got some cute musical thing on their stage there and say that's how we worship God. Listen, the Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you have to create a facade, you have to create something to emotion get you charged up. That is not worshiping God. The worship of God is when we come in spirit and truth. And just like that, 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 uh, that leper, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ and he saw his pitiful condition, he saw the rotting of his flesh and the, the limbs that were falling off and the bumpy coarseness of his skin and he saw that his eyebrow lashes had came off and he saw the Lord Jesus, the perfect son of God. He bowed down. The Bible says he worshipped him. He fell on his knees and he fell on his face and he worshipped God. Listen, we have that kind of a spirit. You don't need a class to learn that. You just get in awe of who Jesus Christ is and you'll fall on your face. And so the Bible says here, we'll be in continuous awe in our worship of God. We will have hearts that are always tender towards the things of God and tender towards others. We will better be able to reach out to people. You know, I remember uh, years ago, someone came up to me and they said, Pastor Fong, how do I get a heart of compassion? You know, they say, they said, sometimes I get, I get encouraged and I just, you know, I hear a speaker get up and they'll preach away and, I, and I'll get encouraged about having this heart of compassion. But I find myself after, after that, that after a day or two or a week or two, I find my heart starting to get a little more crusty and a little bit hard in there. And they said, how do I do that? Well, I'm reminded right here in Jeremiah 9, 24, that we need to understand the Lord and his loving kindness. Jesus looked on the leper and had compassion on him. We 
need to get to this place where we look at people and our hearts are breaking. We're thinking, man, they need the gospel. They need to hear about Jesus Christ. They need to get out of the darkness of idolatry. They need to get out of the darkness of materialism and come to know the Lord. If we know his loving kindness, we'll be able to live out the mercies of God, the long-suffering God, the patience and kindness we need to have to other people. Uh, we will live with the fear that sinners die and go to hell. That'll grip our hearts there. So it's this, uh, this understanding tonight that we have the inferior of personal glory. Personal glory is where we glory in ourselves. Now I want to stop there and just say this tonight. I believe we have a good church, and I believe we have a church of people that really seek to exalt Christ and seek to build up the Lord and exalt Christ from the teaching, preaching of his word. But I want to caution us tonight in our private lives and when we go home that we're not giving glory to ourselves. We're not, we're not looking at our accomplishments and our portfolios and all these things and thinking how great I am because I, I'm going to remind you, it's not how great I am, it's how great he is. Amen? It's how great he is. I'm looking forward to in a few weeks when I'll be preaching from Luke about the rich young ruler. Because every time I read about the rich young ruler, he came with such insincerity. He wanted to know how he can have everlasting life. And he said, I've kept all, these, I've kept all the commandments. We kept all the commandments he wanted Jesus to hear about. And the one commandment that gripped his heart that he did not keep was the one of covetousness. And Jesus said, if you really want to do the right thing, sell everything you have and come follow me. The Bible says he was sad at what he heard. Now I want to ask you tonight this. Look at me tonight. If the Lord stood here at this pulpit and asked me personally and asked you personally to sell everything you have and follow him, would you do it? Would you do it? Or are you so possessed by your possessions, you'd have a difficult time, and you'd be like that rich young ruler. You'd be sad and would walk away. And if we find ourselves with that very difficult question, that it would be difficult for us to do that, then we realize that God doesn't have all of our heart. And he says here, we must be careful of the inferior of personal glory. But notice the second thing. We must be careful of the inferior of pagan glory because all of chapter 10 is revolving around idol worship. It's revolving around the practices of the Jews there because they, they had their, listen, they kept, they kept the ceremonies. I mean, they had their daily sin offerings. They had the daily meal offerings. I mean, they had the burnt offerings. I mean, they had their, they had their annual, the annual Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then after that, they would have the Feast of Pentecost, and at, which is the Feast of Harvest or Feast of Weeks. And after that, they'd have the Feast of... Ta I mean, they kept all those things. I mean, they did all those things. But, uh, but every day, you know what they did in their homes and in their, in their garden groves and places like that? They worshiped their other idols. And Israel got to the place where it began with the golden calf worship, then Dan and Bethel. And from there, they expanded from the golden calf worship where they added Baal and they added Asheroth, they added Moloch, and they added the queen of heaven, and they added all these other gods there. I mean, Israel was a place infested with, with, with other gods. It was this place of pagan worship there. And they knew what the Bible said. I mean, they had memorized the Ten Commandments. I mean, they were good Jews. They knew that the first two, three commandments said this, that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, they knew that it said thou shalt make no graven images. And yet they made the golden calves. And and, they, and God said, you should not make any likeness of anything that's in heaven and earth. Yet they did. And he said, thou shalt not bow down before thyself to them. And he said right there in those Ten Commandments, right in the beginning, he said, for I am a jealous God. They knew all that. And by the way, we know all that. We know that he's a jealous God. We know that he demands that he has all of our affection and all of our love. Somebody help me tonight. But does he? The inferior pagan, pagan, pagan glory. And so now he addresses all this here. And notice some things he says about these pagan gods. He says, you know, basically, if I could summon what I'm going to tell you, he says pagan gods are ugly and they're inferior. I mean, look at verses 2 to 4. He says, pagan gods are made from the imagination of man. Look at it. He says, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. He, the signs of heaven were following the astrologers, the stargazers. As they tried to interpret what was going on, the fortune tellers. Verse 3, he says, for the customs of the people are vain. They get a tree and they cut down a tree, he says there, and they get these, these people to come and, they, and it's the work of the hands of the work with the axe and they deck it, he says, they decorate it with silver and with gold and they fasten it to a wall somewhere with nails and with hammers that it moves not. He says they, they take a tree and they fashion it, they cut it away and they fashion it to some idol of their imagination. I said this earlier, God is who God is, God is not who we want God to be. 
We don't make God to be what we want him to be. God is always who he is. He's a holy God. And so they were making this God of their own imagination. He said in verse 5, they're upright as the palm trees, but they speak not. He said, you've got the, they stand upright, but they can't speak. He said, in fact, your gods that you made, you've cut, you, had to, you had to carve out your gods, and you had to deck them with silver, and you had to deck them with gold, and your God doesn't own the cattle on a thousand hills. By the way, aren't you glad God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Amen. He says, you have, you have to deck it with gold, and you have to deck it with gilt, silver, and you've got to prop it up, and you've got to prop up your God. And by the way, if your God wants to go from point A to point B, you've got to carry him. Well, thank God I've got a God that carries me, amen? amen. Jesus carries us on his shoulders, amen? amen. Idle gods have to be carried by you. They are a heavy weight. They're a burden for us to carry there. Well, he says, you've got to carry them. And then he goes on later on. He said in, uh, he said in verse 5, he says, for they cannot do evil, neither also is in them to do good. I mean, they're inanimate objects. They can't do evil. They can't do good. But I think the word I want to focus on, they cannot. Idols cannot. God can. Amen. And you go on a little bit further, and he says this statement there. He says here, uh, let's see here, in verse 8, he says they are a doctrine of vanities. Uh, he says in verse 11, they have not made and they shall perish. They can't make anything. They're going to perish. You know, he says they have a shelf life. They're shelf gods that have a shelf life. Amen. Verse 14, they are falsehood and they have no breath or life in them. Verse 15, they're vanity. They're the work of ears. They shall be visited. And he says they shall perish. Hey, listen, he's speaking about the inferior of personal glory and the inferior of pagan glory. I mean, Jeremiah is standing to them and just giving them a wake-up call saying, I want you to know this is what you're worshiping. Now, you think of me for just a minute. Is that the American culture? We have to prop up our gods. We have to carry our gods. Our gods determine our ups and downs. I mean, if, you're, if the financial markets, everything going on in the world is affecting your mood about things, that means that you're letting your gods affect you. Listen, I've got a God who says, sorrow may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. I have a God who says, rejoice in the Lord again, and, 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 and rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And we think about pagan glory, we have to remind ourselves it's very easy for us, just like the Jews, when things get better. When we get more educated and we become more learned and we become more aware of things and we grow in our strength and we grow in our riches, if we're not very careful, we allow those things to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. If we're not very careful, it's either personal glory, pagan glory that exalts itself over God. All I'm saying today is there is the inferior. But notice, secondly, we see the incomparable. Jeremiah made the statement, he said in Psalm 115, verse 8, they that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. He said, you are just like your gods. If they're inferior, you don't even recognize who you are. Now, Jeremiah, as he's telling this message to the people, I get this feeling that he just got he said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to preach your message, but I have to stop right in the middle of it because I don't want to give glory to the idols. I want to give glory to you, God. I'm not going to give glory to their sin. I'm going to give glory to my Savior. Amen? And he stops right there in verse 6, and he talks about the incomparable of God. He says, for as much as there's none like unto thee. Now, he just, he just told them about their gods. And previous to that, he told them about the problem of personal glory. And he told them, now he tells them about their pagan glory. And he tells them, I want you to understand something here. He says, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in mine. Now remember Jeremiah where he's standing. He's standing at the gate of the temple. We, went, we saw that, I think, in Jeremiah chapter 6. He's standing at the gate of the temple. He's not finished preaching. And, he, and he's gone back to this, this message. He's gravitated back, talking about these idols that they're worshiping and their personal glory. And he, says, and he stops there, and these people are coming, going, and people are stopping, listening to them. And you have to imagine that the spiritual leaders of the nation, they've stopped there, the priests and the, and the princes and the, and the prophets, they've stopped there, and they're listening to him. The pastors, if you would, they've stopped, and they're listening to him. And he stops right there, and you can imagine Jeremiah, as his eyes are looking up to heaven, he says, for as much, he says, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord. And he said, Lord, I'm talking about these idols 
idols right now to these people. I'm telling them how they cut these idols out of a tree and they've decked it with silver and they've decked it with gold. And I'm telling them, Lord, how they've had to, they've had their workmen come and they've had to nail their, nail their gods to the, to the walls so they can prop them up, they can stand upright, but they can't speak and they can't handle and they can't feel and they can't, you have to carry them if you want to take them somewhere. But he says, Lord, I just want to say this tonight. I'm going to preach your message and I'm going to tell them what's wrong with their idol worship. But God, in the midst of all that, I don't want to forget to tell them that you're a great God and there's none like unto thee. I want to remind them that all these things are going on, but there's none like unto God, none like unto thee, O Lord. He said, for thou art great and thy name is great in thy mind. He says, I just want to say publicly and I want to say loudly, thou art great, O Lord, and thy name is great in mind. And by the way, he wasn't ashamed to let this idol worshiping nation know what he thought about God. He goes on and says in verse 7, For who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appear, appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations. And there were a lot of wise men at that time. He says, And in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. Do you have that conviction tonight that God is incomparable? Not the knowledge. Everybody in this room would say, God is incomparable. There's none like unto him. But do you have the conviction he's incomparable? Now, if we have that conviction, we understand something about this incomparable God. The choir is saying, Almighty, unchangeable God, and he is. But when we say there's none like unto God, there's no comparison. There's no one even close. And by the way, there is no one even close. There's no one even close to God in his ability. And you look at the Old Testament precedent that every Jew had that was, in, that was embedded into their history, that was embedded into their teachings, that was in the Word of God. There is something to be said about the fact there is none, no one even close to who God is in his ability. I mean, I think about the great incident of the, of the opening of the Red Sea. Three, close to three million Jews have been led by Moses out of the land of Egypt. God led them a different way. He led them through the way through the wilderness. There, now they're at the banks of the Red Sea. It's this large, mass body of water. No one ever has done this prior to that. No one has ever been able to swim across where, where they were at. No one's ever, definitely no one could walk across there. And Moses is there, and there's these people there. This is the first time they've been out of Egypt. And they're standing there, and they're realizing they've got to cross this Red Sea, and, and they need to cross that Red Sea to get on the other side, because behind them was the thundering chariots of the Egyptian army, which was coming to take them back captive and bring them back to Egypt. 300 chariots with all their men, and they're scared. They hear the thundering of the chariots behind them. They hear the sloshing of the waters of the Red Sea in front of them. They're angry with Moses. They said, why did you bring us here? We, you should have never brought us out here. And they're thinking what's going on. God shows up on Moses. He says, he says go forward, Moses. He stretches out the rod of God that's in his hand, and the Lord that night started to part the waters. God sent a great wind parted the waters. The waters parted hither and thither. They became like two heaps on both sides. And God opened up that water of the Red Sea in a massive way. He opened up a great passageway all the way across so the children of Israel could walk across. And when they walked across, they walked across dry shot. The water, the, 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 the ground was not muddy. It was not sloshy. It was hardened ground. They were able to walk across that. And everyone that was, every woman that was great with child, everyone that was carrying their children, the elderly those who were infirm, they all looked and they were all in shock and amazement because they were wondering, I don't think I'm going to make it. God made a way for his people to get by there. I'm thinking about the fact when they got to the other side, the people were in awe of the matchlessness of God. They said in their hearts, their minds, there's none like unto the Lord. And you go to Exodus chapter 15 and you listen to the praise and worship they give of God. And they were basically saying that as Miriam and Moses led them. They were saying, there's none like unto God in his ability. There's no God that's ever opened up a Red Sea before. Well, you go from there, and we read as now they're in the wilderness, and they're, they're in awe of this fact that there's none like, like unto God in his ability in opening the Red Sea. There was none like unto God in defeating the Canaanite and Amorite nations because along the way, as they're in the wilderness, they had to encounter the Amorites. And the Amorites were giant nations. Now, every time we read the Bible and we study it, we think about giants, probably the first 
person comes to a lot of our minds is Goliath. We think about Goliath the giant, and that's a popularized story. It's a great story. It's a true story. How, how uh, David had to encounter Goliath the giant, who was about almost 10 feet tall. But there were giants during the time of Moses that are among the Amorite, the Amorite people that were much taller than even, than even Goliath. If you read and study over there in Deuteronomy chapter 3, read about Sihon and Og. Og had a bed so long, it's estimated that Og could have been as tall as 12 to 14 feet in height. When you think about the bed that he slept in, I mean, this was a massive man. There were massive giants. And the Bible tells us that in Numbers 13, that there were giants in the land. I mean, the Amorites were a giant people. And so they tried to pass through Sihon and Og, and we realized that they did not. And so God enabled Moses, and God enabled the children of Israel. They went to battle against Sihon and Og, and they defeated them, and they beat them, and they were used as a testimony. Listen to what the testimony is in the book of Psalms. Psalms 135, verse 10, one of many times this is mentioned. It says this, in Psalms 135, verse 10, it says, Who smote the great nations and slew the mighty kings. And the mighty kings were Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land for a heritage, a heritage to Israel's people. When you read Psalms 107, you read Psalms 106, you read Psalms 135, you know what the psalm is saying? Lord, there's none like unto thee, O God. I mean, there's no one who compares to God in his ability. Oh, we go on from there. That's not the end of it. By the way, God is still demonstrating himself that there's none like unto God. God we go on beyond that. Now we go to the time of Joshua. And Joshua now is, is, is leading Israel into the promised land, into the land of promise in the Canaan. And they're conquering nation after nation. We get to Jeremiah chapter, uh, excuse me, Joshua chapter 10. In Joshua 10, there's these five Canaanite nations, five Canaanite kings who became a confederacy thinking that they joined together, they could defeat Joshua and, and all of Israel there. Well, and to make things worse, they stayed up in the mountain area, so Joshua and his men, they went up there to fight with them, and they started to beat them, and, and what happened there, God started to send hailstones down, and the hailstones were great hailstones, mighty hailstones that started to defeat them. The Bible says this, more men died from the hailstones that came from heaven than they did by the sword. I mean, that was God. None to be compared to God his ability. Well, Joshua saw what God was doing, and Joshua got very courageous and had great faith in God, and he prayed one of the greatest prayers of all the Bible. He prayed there in Joshua 10, verses 12 to 14, for God to hold the sun still and the moon still for one entire day. And so he prayed that of God. And the Bible says this, then spake Joshua to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of all Israel, sun stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ayalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed unto the people and avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. I want you to imagine this. They had never seen a day where the sun didn't set except that day. That was the one one day in history, the sun did not set. I mean, who can compare to God in his ability? And the Bible just wanted, because some of us forget about these things, and because some of us kind of for, just get used to those things, the Bible wanted to remind us in verse 14, said, and there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened it to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Hey, my brother, sister in Christ, there's none like unto the Lord in his ability. He opens the Red Sea, he defeats the giants, he holds the sun still for one day. But then I think about great kings. Several years go by and they're the great kings. And so one of the start of the great nations began with the nation of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. You ought to get a history book and read the exploits of Nebuchadnezzar. And all the things he did and all the battles and the conquerings he did how the Egyptians were conquered and the Assyrians were conquered. And a day came, and Daniel's there in the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was great. He started to glorying in his wisdom and his riches and in his might. And Daniel had interpreted a dream and told him, he said, King, You've seen God work. You saw my three friends in that fiery furnace, and God preserved them. And you gave glory to God then. He said, sir, you better watch out. You're at a place right now you think you're unconquerable. He says, God can put you down. And he got up one day, and he thought, man, there's none like unto me. I'm the greatest there. 
And he, the Bible says this in verse, chapter 4, verse 34, at the end of the day, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. You say, well, he sounds like he's praising God. Yeah, that's before God humbled him. That's after God humbled him, excuse me. God had to humble him, and God brought him down on all fours. He walked around for several years as an animal. His hair grew out, and his nails grew out. I mean, he was a pit very pitiful sight. And he'd be out there in the daytimes when the dew of heaven would come down, and he'd be drenched with dew. But he was just like an animal. He ate grass like an animal. God humbled him. And then the Bible says, as we just read in verse 34, his eyes looked up to heaven. He praised God. He gave glory to God. He blessed the Most High. I believe in verses 34 and 35 that Nebuchadnezzar put his faith in the Lord. I believe Nebuchadnezzar may have gotten saved at that moment of time. I believe he got saved because he put his eyes on the Lord. But listen, he came to the realization there's none like unto the Lord. Now listen, you can be in church and you can hear all the stories and, and you can hear about answered prayers and you can hear about miracle salvations and miracle healings, but unless you experience yourself, you won't really understand there's none like unto God in his ability. I want to encourage you tonight. You need to come to the conviction of realize your heart. There's none like unto God in his ability. But notice something else. There's none like unto God in his assistance. All of us come to this place in life where we have these difficult moments. Problems we are not sure how to solve. Situations we're not sure how to deal with. And I think you're like me. I'm appreciative of verses that encourage us that God is our helper. And I'm thinking tonight of Psalm 46.1 where it says, God is my refuge and strength a very present help in time of need. Or later on, where it says in Hebrews 13, the Lord is my helper and will not be afraid of what man shall do unto me. Now, brother and sister Christ, there's none like unto God in his ability. And we need that because it increases our faith. And we need that. It helps us in our praying. And we need that when we're going through difficult moments as a church. We need to be reminded of the greatness of God in his ability. But I remind you tonight of the greatness of God in his assistance. Listen, God is there for us corporately. God is there for us individually to help you and I in our time of need. I'm reminded tonight of Abraham during the, after the rescue of Lot that he got very scared and nervous because he thought, well, you know what? I did a surprise attack. I defeated these, these, these Canaanite kings and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And he started crying out to God and God came to him. And he said, Abraham, I want you to know something. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He says, on one hand, I'm going to shield you, but I want to remind you that I am your exceeding great reward. I'm your covering, but I'm also your compensation. God, I'm going to, he said, Abraham, I'm going to take care of you. I'm reminded tonight of Shamgar and his ox school, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. One verse of scripture. We might, if you sneeze, you might not even see uh, that verse of scripture there in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 3. Shamgar was just a farm boy. Shamgar, all he had was an ox goal, that kind of a cattle prod thing that you would poke, poke cattle in the back with. And there were 600 men that came after, that came to, 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 to attack Israel. And he went out. Nobody else went out to battle. He took his ox goal. With an ox goal, he defeated 600 men. He used what he had in his possession. But it wasn't Shamgar who was great. And it wasn't Shamgar's ox goal. It was the God of Shamgar that helped him. God helped him in his battle there. I think of tonight about Hezekiah. And when Sennacherib came with his 200,000 men, and Hezekiah put, took the letter that Sennacherib sent him and he laid it out before God in the temple and he prayed and he said, God, you've got to do something. That night, God sent an angel. He solved in a way that Hezekiah could have never dreamed of. Hezekiah didn't have the army. He didn't have the resources, but he had God, amen? And God came down and God sent an angel and 200,000 of those men died in their sleep. I think of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah who we just referred to earlier during the days of Daniel were placed in the fiery furnace. And at the end of the time, when God had delivered them, Nebuchadnezzar said this, there's no other God that can deliver after this sword. I think about Daniel in the lion's den. At the end of the day, Cyrus the king said this, uh, excuse me, Darius the king said this, he is the living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be unto the end. I'm reminded tonight, brother and sister in Christ, there's none like unto God in his assistance. Hey, if you're going through a valley and you're, needing, you're, needing, you're in trouble and you're in need of help, I remind Mind you, tonight, there's none like unto God in his assistance for the people of God. Oh, there's none like unto God in his ability. There's none like unto God in his assistance. But I remind you tonight, there's none like unto God in his atonement. 
I mean, there's none like unto God in the, who's the author of the plan of salvation. Jesus came to earth to die for our sins. Listen, man has tried to find a way as early as the days of Cain and Abel to try to find a way to atone for their sin. Abel offered a blood sacrifice to God. Cain thought, well, I can do, I can do the same thing, but I can take of the fruits of my garden, the best of my garden. And he did give his best. He gave his all, but he tried to bring religion to God when God wanted a relationship with Cain. And he told Cain this. He said, now, Cain, if thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. But if thou doest not well, he said, sin lies at the door. He said, listen, that's what religion is. Religion is trying to find its own way to God. Hey, Christianity is God reaching down to you and me. Thank God for the atonement of Jesus Christ. Man tries to find a way through baptism. Man tries to find a way through church membership. Man tries to find a way through good works. Man tries to find a way through some religious means. They try to keep some rituals. They try to do things. I mean, we could take every religion in the world and we could break down those religions about the, the core the core aspect of that religion in terms of their good work or whatever it is that they do. But I remind you that in, the, in, in the, what we have through Jesus Christ, the atonement, salvation through Jesus Christ, I remind you, God gave his best and God gave his all and God gave us the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. God loves his creation and God loves us. The Bible tells in, in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, what religion has a, what religion is there in the world that would give its only begotten son to die for the sins of the world who would become sin for us? And I remind you tonight of the greatness. There's none to be compared to the salvation of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I remind you tonight that there's no religion where the shed blood, they have the shed blood of a Savior that can die for them. A perfect son. A perfect sinless Savior. Only Jesus Christ can do that. He's the perfect substitute. He's the perfect sacrifice. There's none that compares to God in his atonement. And listen tonight, when I think about salvation, it's the great the salvation that we have that God has given us. Who's, and God is the God of salvation. I think about this. We have the greatest, the greatest news, the greatest thing we could tell people, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about what it says in 2 Timothy 1.10. God, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality light through Jesus Christ through the light of the gospel. I mean, think, fathom that thought. He's abolished death, the death of death. And he's brought immortality life through the gospel. I mean, the gospel saves. The gospel, the power of God to salvation. The gospel changes life. The gospel makes a difference. The gospel takes a man who, who lives a life for himself and changes that man at the, at the age of 55. And at the age of 55, he's changed. And now he's telling other people about what Jesus did for him. I'm telling you tonight, the gospel cleans a man's life up. The, the gospel changes a man. Hey, the gospel does. The gospel does what no rehab program can do. The gospel does what no depression medicine can do. The gospel does what no doctor can do. Hey, the gospel does what no politician can do. The gospel does what money cannot buy. Listen, money can't buy your salvation. Only the blood of Jesus Christ buys your salvation. There's none like unto God. It's atonement. His atonement is powerful. It saves us. His atonement is passionate. He loves us. His atonement is personal. That, God, that the salvation that you and I have was personally designed for you and I. And so we think about tonight. Our Lord is unrivaled. He's unparalleled. He's incomparable. He's unsurpassed. We see the inferior. We see the incomparable quickly as we close. Would you go back to Jeremiah 10? Would you notice from all this the instruction? He says, There's none like unto thee, O Lord. Jeremiah, as he's writing this by the leading of the Holy Spirit, is trying to impress on the people as he kind of pauses in the middle of this message and telling them that there's no one and nothing even close in comparison to God. He wraps this all up by giving a strong word of instruction. Now, the people already know, and we know, that personal glory and pagan glory are inferior to God. And the people know and we know there's none like unto God. I mean, just he sums it up better than I could have done tonight. I mean, just he says, You're great, and your name is great in heaven. He says, Who's like unto thee, O Lord? And so notice the instruction he gives us as we close tonight is threefold, real quickly. Notice, first of all, if you go to chapter seven, chapter 10, notice verses 70 and 22, and I'm just going to skip through some verses. He instructs us about the pressing. Something urgent. 
Because as Jeremiah is standing in the gate, he's preaching away this one continuous message. He reminds them here in verse 17 to 22. Judgment's coming from the north. The Babylonians are coming. They're taking down nation after nation after nation. And he's right there in verse 17, he's pressing them to realize judgment's coming and we must be repentant. So notice verse 17, he says, Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. In a way, he's kind of uh, mocking them. He says, you think your city is a fortress. You think living inside Jerusalem is going to protect you. He says, you better gather up all your belongings. Literally, the word wares means this, gather up your backpack. Get your backpack up. Get your suitcase packed. He says, gather up all your belongings, he said, for thus saith the Lord, behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them that they might find it so. Now the pressing is this. He says, you're on a different time clock than God. And God's time clock is saying, judgment's coming, and you better stop relaxing, and you better stop fooling around, and you, stop, you better stop thinking that it's not going to happen to me, and put your head inside of a, inside, in, in the ground thinking it's not going to happen there. He says, judgment's coming. You better gather your stuff because the day's coming. God says, I'm going to sling you out. He says, I'm going to thrust you out of the land. He says, you're going to be taken. If you're not killed first, you're going to be taken captive into, into Babylon there. He says, many of you be taken captive. I'm going to thrust you out. I'm going to throw you out of the land, he says there. I'm going to sling you out. And he has the idea of a sling. I'm going to sling you out of the land, he says, and you'll be, and you'll be filled with distress. And he says, you're going to find it. So he's telling them something that's pressing. Now, brother and sister Christ, I don't want to bring a downer on, on Memorial Day weekend. And I, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to put thoughts in your mind that, you know, that, you know, we, you know, woe is me and things like that. But I want to remind you today, God is a God of judgment. As a God of judgment, we have to remind ourselves, God has to deal with sin. And if you haven't figured this out yet, I mean, if you start looking, reading through right now, just the ballots and who's running for what, what they believe, and the kind of stuff our world is gravitating towards, what our nation is gravitating towards, I mean, we're in trouble. I mean, we are in deep trouble. I mean, the things going on in our world right now, we are in very, very deep trouble. And I want to tell you, spiritually, we're in trouble. Morally, we're in trouble. I mean, raising children in this day and age, this, can't be, this has to be the hardest, most difficult time to raise children right now. I mean, just the decisions parents have to make. And you say, well, I'm going to insulate my kid. Listen, the only place you're, only place you're going to insulate your kid is in your own home. But you get them out there to other people, you're, they're, it's just, and, he, and Jeremiah's just saying, I want you to know the pressing. He says, now I've, t- I've, t- I've tried to help you. I've told you about that which is inferior, and I've told you about God who's incomparable. But he says, you know what, the, the time's going to come. Some of you are not going to listen. And some of you are going to go back doing your own thing. You're going to be running your own business, doing your own stuff there. You're going to be just taking care of your own things, running your little clubs and doing your stuff there. He said, I want to understand something. He says, God's telling me to tell you, you better gather up your stuff. He says, because the day's coming. It's going to hit you. It's going to hit you so fast. He said, I'm going to just throw you out of the land. There's the pressing, but notice secondly, would you notice the practices? Look at verse 2. Instruction number 2 is about their practices. He says, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Now, he's addressing their idol worship. But with the idol worship came the adoption of practices that other people did. Now, the word heathen sometimes can be a very derogatory term that's used incorrectly about people. The word heathen is the same word we get our word nations from. The same idea. Nations. He says, learn not the way of the nations. Learn not the way of the world. He's saying, what he's saying there is that we're not to be conformed to the world. He's saying, you don't, don't learn their practice. And here's what's going on. They were putting their kids in, in, in school systems where their kids were coming home and they were not... They were not living like Jewish kids. They weren't living like children of the Lord. They were living like the children of the world. And the people were in business, and they were dealing with these other nations, 
And instead of having a good testimony of that, they let the nations affect them instead of them affecting the nations. And so he had to kind of stop there right then. He said, while I'm at it, I'm just going to tell you, don't learn the way of the heathen. He said, don't, don't pick up their practices. He says, don't gravitate like that. Don't mimic the world. Don't let the world seduce you. Be not conformed to the world. He said, be careful here. There are a lot of voices crying out to you. And he says, don't let those voices cry out the voice of God. Don't let the voice of the politicians, the voice of the educators, the voice of whoever may be, the corporate culture dictate your life. He says, learn not the way of the heathen. Now, what's he saying to us? He's saying the same thing the Bible repeatedly tells us. He says, be not conformed to the world. We're to be in the world. We're not to be like the world. We're going to be in the world. We're going to be in the world. We have to be, but we're to be a light in this world. He's reminding us today, be careful that we don't let the world and its way of thinking, that we, we, we fall in love with it and we let it pull us away. Because you know what happens? You can spend a week outside of church and a week outside the Word of God, and it's amazing how quickly the world will pull you away from the Lord. It really does. You're reading Wall Street Journal and Barron's more than you're reading the Word of God. It's pulling you away from God. You're reading Newsmax more than you're reading your Bible. It's pulling you away from God. You're spending all your time on social media trying to impress yourself how I did somebody else and all this other kind of stuff. You're, you're, spending, you're spending time that's not with God. He says, learn not the way of the heathen. He addresses the pressing. He addresses the practices. Finally, look at verses 20 through 25. He addresses, he gives us a prayer. Verse 23, this is Jeremiah's prayer. He's about to finish up this message. He's preaching at the gate. And remember, the, the theme of the book of Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Now, if you've caught it, you'll recognize Jeremiah is just, there are moments in his preaching, he's just broken. I mean, he's really broken. I mean, look at, we get an instance of this right here in verse 19. He says, woe is me for my hurt. You know what's the hardest thing for a preacher who just, they see things? He feels like, am I the only one that understands this? Am I the only one that's concerned? Am I the only one that's broken about this? And that's what Jeremiah was saying. He says, am I the only one? He said, and he wasn't pitching a pity party. He's broken. He loved his people. He loved his nation. By the way, it's Memorial Day. Let's love America. Amen? Amen. Woe is me for my hurt. He was hurting for his people. He says, my wound is grievous. I'm bleeding out. But I said, truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. Now, he wasn't pitching a pity party to draw attention to himself. He was saying, okay, this goes with the job. This goes with the calling. I've got to bear it. I've got to have endurance. He said, I, I, it's not what I want to do, but i got to do it. Hey, let me tell you tonight, you know, if you're going to really live for God, you going to really live for God? You'll find yourself in that Jeremiah place. That you're going to feel the wound and the hurt. And you're, but you've got to kind of realize it's not God punishing you. You've got to bear it. It goes with the calling. It goes with the territory. And so he's saying, now we get to the prayer of Jeremiah. He's brokenhearted. And in verse 23, let me tell you what he's saying there. In verse 23, he's acknowledging how inadequate he is and the people are. He says, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his head. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know where he's going. And he's acknowledging how inadequate we are. Then we go to verse 24. In his prayer, he's saying, we must acknowledge we need correction. I just want to pause and look at verse 24. And verse 24 is a great prayer for us to, to, to adopt in our life. He said, O Lord... Correct me, but with judgment. Not in thy anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Here is Jeremiah acknowledging he needs correction. He's acknowledging he needs to be judged. Because you notice he's preaching about the sins of people. He's thinking about his own sins. By the way, if we, if we can preach about other people's sins and not feel our sense about our sins, there's something wrong there. Amen? And he says the sins in his life. He said, correct me. But not in anger, Lord, because he's thinking about how terrible he is. And by the way, all of us ought to be a place where we think about ourselves in comparison to an incomparable God that we're just like this. We're like this. We go from this to this. We're nothing. So he's acknowledging 
He's nothing before God, and that he needs correction. Finally, his praying was t- he's telling, teaching us this. Our praying in verse 25 should be that God's kingdom comes and that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Because he's saying here, Lord, the nations are not turning to you, and the nations know about you, and the nations know about the Red Sea, and the nations know how, God, you helped our people to build, rebuild the walls in 52 days. And they know about the Jordan River. And so his prayer is, pour out thy fury upon the nations or the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name, for they've eaten up Jacob. He's talking about the Babylonians who are going to come down. They've, they've eaten up Jacob and have devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. You know, he's praying here. He's instructing us how to pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to tell you tonight, we don't need to pray for the judgment of God because God's already announced his judgment. But we do need to pray for God to help us to judge ourselves, as he said in verse 24. We need to judge ourselves. And Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 11. If we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. We need to judge ourselves. And I want to end on the note like this tonight. Isaiah had a spectacular moment in his life that Jeremiah knew about. It was the year the king Uzziah died. Uzziah was his hero. Uzziah, Uzziah, for most of his life, was a great king. Until that day, he tried to usurp the office of the high priest and to offer up the incense at the altar he wasn't supposed to do. And as Uriah the prophet came in, the high priest came in, excuse me, he says, you do that which appertaineth not to thee. And the Bible says he became wrath. He was filled with wrath against the priest. He said, who are you to tell me what to do? And by the way, pause, let me pause on that tonight. May God help us tonight. We never get to a place where we're not teachable or we can't be preached to or if we're rebuked that we don't take with the spirit of meekness because if we ever get to that place, we, we're getting an Uzziah type of attitude there. And Uzziah, the Bible says he rose up with wrath in him and the Bible says the leprosy covered him from his feet all the way to his forehead. He died of leprosy in a leprous house. He wasn't even buried with the kings. It was so, so shameful how he died. And so Isaiah is discouraged. He's crying. He's weeping. His eyes were on him. And his eyes were on his hero. Then it says in Isaiah 6, Then I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw a vision of the holiness of God. How God is holy. His train filled the temple. And what got his attention was hearing those seraphim sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of thy glory. His response to that is, Woe is me, for I'm a man undone with unclean lips. You know what happens tonight? I'm done. When we're able to see the incomparableness of God, that there's none like unto God, there's none like him in his attributes. That we understand him as loving kindness and his judgment and his righteousness. The three core attributes of his holiness. We understand him for who he is. We start to realize how miserable we are. And we can be like Isaiah and say, Lord, woe is me. And that's where Jeremiah was at. He said, Lord, correct me, but not in anger. He said, lest I be turned into nothing. Tonight, I'm going to encourage you this evening. That maybe we need the Lord to help us to have a conviction about the fact that God, there's none like unto God. And we need, to, we need this conviction tonight that there's none like unto him in his ability. There's none like unto him in his assistance. And there's none like unto him in his atonement. That God would change us and transform us and grow us, be more like him. I'm going to pray for three groups of people tonight, as I did this morning. I'm going to pray for those who feel like you're in a place where you need God's help in your life in a special way, that God will give you that help. Group number two, I'm going to pray for all of us tonight, that God will give us greater faith in who God is. Because as we think about God, so is our faith. We need to increase our faith tonight. Group number three tonight, I'm praying that the Lord would grip our hearts. He would grip our hearts as I said this morning, about the great need of who he is and the importance of getting the gospel out and reaching people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand, please.